At Parker, our purpose is simple. We want to make the world a better place. By working more efficiently. By using more sustainable practices. By developing better technologies. We keep moving forward. With each new idea, innovation, and partnership, we're one step closer to fulfilling our purpose every single day. To find out more, visit parker.com slash purpose. Parker, engineering your success. With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herb Tell. Uh, welcome back to Herb Tell. Okay, one of our favorites. She is the senior editor for Ordinary-Times.com. She is an attorney. Uh, she is a lot of things in the writing community and people on Twitter mostly like her. Our friend Tim Carpenter is joining <laughs> us once again. How are you, ma'am? I'm well, Andrew. Thank you for having me. Uh, how are the HIPAA wars? <laughs> it's a very angry HIPAA. Got to be careful. <laughs> for those of you not paying attention, uh, since she is a lawyer and does uh, healthcare related things, HIPAA is one of her, um, I don't know what you want to call it, uh, things of the moment she pays high attention to. So if you mess it up on Twitter, you're likely to get a tweet about it. But uh, today we're going to talk a little lawyer ease. You are a lawyer, one of them law splainer type people. What do you make of the ABA talking about getting rid of the LSAT? Now, we've heard this in the news a lot lately. Uh, there was some debate, I thought, pretty unfairly um, during the Supreme Court nominations about uh, LSAT scores. You wrote a piece of Ordinary Dash Times that pretty much dispelled that. However, uh, if we're going to get rid of something, we have to discuss what its actual use is. So let's just start there with the nomenclature. What is the LSAT? What's it supposed to be? And what is it being used as that folks want it reformed? The LSAT is the law school admissions test. And just to be clear, what the ABA is doing is they are not, quote, getting rid of the LSAT. The LSAT is still existing. What, what it is, is they're, the rule um, that the ABA used to have for accredited law schools was that they were required to require an entrance exam, an LSAT or other. Um, some, some used GREs, but they, what they have done is they've said that they are no longer requiring accredited law schools to require an entrance exam at all. They still can. And I suspect a lot of schools probably will continue to do so for a variety of reasons. But the LSAT is a standardized test like, a, like the GRE or the MCAT, which is the medical school equivalent. And it is a, um, an aptitude test to, that's designed, whether it does it accurately or well, I don't, can't speak to that, but it is designed to determine whether or not uh, one per, a person's reasoning skills, their logic skills, their um, whether they actually have a, a good chance of success in law school based on how they think, um, how they solve problems, their comprehension, things like that. So it's not a test about what do you know about the law? You don't know, you, you know, theoretically know nothing about the law before you have actually gone to law school. So there are no legal questions on the LSAT. So that's what it is. And the intention of it is to, as a measure, a metric to help law schools accept students who they believe have a chance of success. We went now. We went over this when we did the Supreme Court nomination hearings for uh, soon to be Justice uh, Jackson here shortly. Uh, just to tee it up, though, for the trivia buffs out there, how many law questions are on the LSAT? Zero. There are no legal questions on the LSAT. You are not presupposed to have any legal knowledge before you sit for that exam. You have not been to law school yet. They don't expect you to know the law. So just for the people that will never have the great pleasure of taking an LSAT, uh, I'm not one of them because I actually took the thing just on a lark just to see how I do on it. What it, This isn't like a normal test. This isn't, this isn't just fill in bubble fields. This isn't, you know, flashcards. Explain to people what is actually going on on this test because a lot of folks – Maybe they haven't done logic problems and things like this. Just kind of given a little bit of an explainer of what the test is actually like to take. Uh, it's been um, 
couple of decades since I took it, so I don't recall every section. Um, I know, you know, there are, like any other standardized test, where you have to read a passage and answer questions about it. And um, But my favorite part is, as you mentioned, the logic puzzles. And, and those are the ones where you have a list of uh, uh, statements such as, you know, there are five people at a party and the person in red is sitting next to Mary. Mary's not sitting next to the person in green. The person in green is eating chicken and, you know, things like that. And based on the information you're giving, you are supposed to figure out where is everybody sitting, what color are they wearing, and what are they eating. It sounds funny or um, confusing, but, and a lot of people really hate those puzzles. I love them. I have an app on my phone where I do them for fun. Um, so that's one of the one of the sections. And then again, I think the rest is mostly uh, reading comprehension and, and the ability to write clearly. Yeah, well, that explains a few things about your personality. We were wondering about that you do those things for fun. M. Carpenter, lawyer, joining us, senior writer at, at ordinary-times.com. What, what's your general feel on this, though? I know you said this is going to be more of a guidance, but the ABA does have outsized influence. Um, I know you don't think they're going to get rid of it totally, but what, what is your feel that the reaction at the academic level, at the law school level is going to be for this? Well, I think that, like I said, I don't think that a lot of law schools are going to be eager to dump it, to get rid of it altogether. Um, I actually did very well on the LSAT. Um, and it's a good thing that I did because I admit that my undergraduate grades, they were not um, not particularly impressive. You know, I graduated, I made it through, but um, they weren't, I wasn't, you know, top of my class or anything. Uh, but however, I, as I said, I did very well on this LSAT and I applied to four law schools. I was accepted to four law schools. Um, three of them were out of state. So, and those are, and I mentioned that just because it's difficult to get into an out of state law school in general. And so I can tell you that I, from my experience, they look at the LSAT score very closely, especially if you do very well. In fact, one of the schools that I applied to actually solicited me to apply. Uh, it was Rutgers at the Camden campus in New Jersey, sent me um, a packet asking me to apply, waived the application fee, uh, because they were actually trying to prove or trying to show a correlation between LSAT scores and law school success being stronger than academic uh, achievement or, you know, your grades from undergrad. Um, unfortunately, the money they were offering me was not enough to make me want to live in Camden, New Jersey for three years. And so I didn't go. But um, so I think, you know, there, there are schools that believe it to be a better indicator than, than just a GPA uh, of one's ability to succeed in law school. And um, and for me, I think that was important because not that I couldn't have done better in, in college, but I commuted I, uh, for a lot of my time there at WVU. I, I drove back and forth. Um, I worked full time. My grades weren't as good as they could have been. Now, if I'd had all the time in the world to study, then, you know, I may have done better, but it wasn't, I wasn't in a position to do that. So um, the LSAT, I think, gave me a leg up to make up for some of that, that time I um, couldn't put into my uh, undergraduate schooling. For others, I know standardized testing is a negative. They don't necessarily test well, and it can be unfair to them if they are judged just on the LSAT um, more than their grades. So I think the adoption of a hybrid approach is maybe a, a good idea uh, for law schools to look into. Um, I think there should be some, there, there needs to be some weeding of law school uh, applicants and and not everyone gets accepted. There is one school that, that was known for basically accepting anyone who applied. Um, and it was not an accredited school. Don't know if it is now. It wasn't for a very long time, I know. And what they did was they would basically let in anybody who applied and was willing to pay their very, uh, very exorbitant annual tuition. And then after the first year, they would basically kick out half the class for poor academic performance or for not, not doing as well um, as, they, as they should. In the meantime, they pocketed their money and left them with the debt. So I think there is something to be said for trying to figure out who is going to do well in law school. And I think, and that's why this test measures how you are, your ability to answer questions in a certain way or to think logically, because they think that those are the skills necessary for law school success. 
since you brought it up and it's been uh, two decades since you did the law school process, um, it sounds like this has been an ongoing issue because if, you know, schools like Rutgers was trying to do their numbers and their data on this all the way back then, this sounds like a problem that's just kind of always been ongoing and this is just the latest chapter in it. Is that an accurate way of portraying this? I think so. Yeah. Sounds accurate. Great. Talking to M. Carpenter, our good friend and legal eagle. Uh, let's take the other side of this. The argument you just briefly touched on it is that if schools got rid of the LSAT, it would increase gatekeeping. It would not allow students, like you said, uh, to get in that otherwise might not have uh, certain connections. Do you think that's a valid criticism? And do you think that's an ongoing problem or a problem that could get worse? I do think that's an ongoing problem and the problem that could get worse. I think that there that uh, there is a lot of gatekeeping. Um, and yeah, I, you know, <sighs> Your ability to focus only on your schoolwork and your academics is a luxury that people with certain backgrounds don't have. Um, I was somebody who went to college um, with some small loans and a couple of small scholarships and a whole lot of Pell Grant. Uh, my, my expected family contribution was zero. Uh, because my parents made very little money, so they weren't expected to foot the bill for any of that. So, um, you know, I had my tuition paid, my room and board for my first year when I lived in the dorm, and then a little bit of extra money to live on, but that's not enough. I, so I worked most of through college, um, especially toward the end of, of my undergrad years where I worked full time. Um, and there was just a lot of real life going on. So I didn't have as much time to study. I couldn't spend all evening in the library or all weekend in the library uh, or studying because I had to work. So I think that that did affect my grades, my grade point average, um, some other things that happened in my in my personal life at the time that impacted my ability to really focus. Um, so, yeah, I think that that the problem of the of taking away the standardized test for people who have um, had an easier time of it in, in undergrad, you know, may, might have a leg up and those are you know, generally people that don't have to focus a lot uh, on outside things and can and can focus on school or they have, you know, a family with connections that can help to get them in. Um, on the flip side, I do understand that testing is sometimes biased in certain ways to certain life experiences, um, that there are people who just simply do not test well, that it's, it's not fair for them. And I do understand that. So that's why, again, some hybrid of the two or some uh, flexibility in, in admissions is the important thing. Talking to our friend, M. Carpenter, when we get back, we're going to talk a little bit more about that actual law school experience. Uh, we're going to loan lead that into the student loan debate that's going on. Why law school is so expensive. Is that one of those prohibitive gatekeeping things we've been talking about it and a little bit more about the LSAT. Our talk with our lawyer friend, senior editor at ordinary-times.com and Carpenter continues on her tell right after this. At Parker, our purpose is simple. We want to make the world a better place by working more efficiently, by using more sustainable practices, by developing better technologies. We keep moving forward. With each new idea, innovation, and partnership, we're one step closer to fulfilling our purpose every single day. To find out more, visit parker.com slash purpose. Parker, engineering your success. Hertel, our good friend, M. Carpenter, one of our favorites, one of the smartest people we know, great writer, senior editor at Ordinary-Times.com. Make sure you go check out all her work. She usually does Wednesday Ritz, but she's been a little busy saving the world in her day job. So that's been a little spotty, but she did do one last week. Thank you very much for showing up to work. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, that's a joke. I'm kidding. Uh, let's talk about that law school experience for just a second. Law school has always been prohibitive. It's always been tough to get into. It's always been extremely expensive. Are we reaching kind of a critical point, though, where maybe it's gotten too inclusive, too hard to get into, and too expensive? Um, too expensive, yes, I think is definitely too expensive. I, uh, education costs 
or no, not the cost, but the cost to the students, not necessarily the cost of providing that education, goes up all the time, goes up every year. Um, and in law school, just by way of example, when I finished college, I had about $16,000 in loan debt for my four years of undergrad. Uh, my first year of law school, for which there are no Pell Grants, um, my first year's debt from law school was 16000 And I know it's probably a lot more than that now, obviously, in 20 years that's gone up. Um, and I guess, you know, they expect that once you graduate from law school, you're, you know, you're going to be in a position to get a well, well paying job and to pay those loans back with ease. Um, I'm one of those who did not go to big law, go to a firm directly out. In fact, I started out in a small town, small county prosecutor's office making about $30,000 a year. Um, so it's not the same experience for everyone. So uh, yeah, I think the cost is is a bit expensive. So depending on what you plan to do with your law degree, and if you want to be a public defender, which I've said on here before, in my opinion is the highest calling of a lawyer. If you want to make a, your career in public defense, you're, you're never going to make those huge salaries and, and pay back these exorbitant loans. So um, I think that's a good argument then for some debt forgiveness or programs for people who take those types of jobs um, and aren't making the big, you know, six figure incomes. Um, as far as how much gatekeeping should go on for law school admissions, I think the best way to weed out people who shouldn't be there is your first year of classes. That first year, your 1L year is notoriously difficult and, and some people say is designed to weed out those who don't have what it takes. Uh, yes, it's a different, it's a different way of learning. It's a different type of education than people are used to. Um, take some adjustment. You definitely have to study. There's not as much ability to kind of skate by with uh, your your intelligence without actually studying a lot. So a lot of people don't make it. Don't come back at the end of your first year. Your second year, a lot of people who were there the, the year before are gone. Um, unfortunately, that means they may have been left with a year's worth of law school debt that they now may not have the money to pay back. So it, it's um, it's a hard balance. See, this is the thing people talk about lawyers talking to him, Carpenter, our friend. This is the same problem every other career field is currently having where the promise is, well, you get your college degree and then you get a great paying job. Well, the promise is you go to law school and you get an even better paying job. But the reality is there's only so many of those better paying jobs and there's a lot more lawyers coming out of law school than there are those great paying jobs, right? So the there's a problem with the pipeline system of saying, hey, go to law school and get a great job. I'll just take all this student debt. Law school, it seems like the law school, if anything, it may be even more predatory with the lending than with just the regular college stuff that we're seeing, isn't it? I think so. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't think attention is paid to those who are not going to to come out of the um, out of law school with a, a a huge job. There's, you know, there's a lot of deferments and there's um, income based repayment options and, and a lot of uh, ways in which you know your loan payments can be adjusted, um, but they all have their downfalls. You know, the the lower your payment, the longer you're going to be paying, and the more interest you're going to be paying. Um, so there's a lot of to, to, of considerations there. Um, you know, a lot of lawyers, when they hear people talk about, you know, they're, they want to go to law school, you always hear, oh, don't do it, don't do it. And, and they'll try to talk you out of it and say, you know, do something else. I would never do that. Um, I love, I love being a lawyer. I love going to law school. I think it's a, it is a noble profession. I don't care what you say, Andrew. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you do think, it so I can lean on you and I don't have to do it. So yes, you, I'll agree with you. You make a lot of lawyer jokes at my expense. That's why I say that. Um, but I think it's an, it's a good profession. It's a noble profession. Everyone hates lawyers until they need one and, and, and they actually get help from one. So I think it's, um, I don't, I don't want to dissuade people from going to law school. I don't want to encourage people to take on um, $200,000 worth of debt for their, their legal education. I certainly did not. Uh, and I know a lot of people want to go to the top tier law schools. So, you know, it helped to help them get that 
high paying job and, and, and it might work out for them, but you can go to a um, school, a perfectly, perfectly good law school like I did, WVU. It's not uh, Harvard, it's not Yale, but I'm doing just fine. And I know, you know, I have classmates who have, who went on to firms and, and are doing very well. So I think that you know, you don't have to go into six figure or, or double six figure debt um, to get a law degree. You can do it, you, you know, adjust your expectations, adjust your standards. You can do well and, and not incur that much debt. It's everybody thinks that you're going to, um, every lawyer has $250,000 worth of debt. That's not the case, certainly not the case for me and uh, probably not the norm. So I think that you hear the loudest, most egregious tales and egregious stories, but I think that it's still, it's doable. Um, do I wish that I had less debt? Yes. I wish I had uh, been able to pay uh, more of it at the time. A lot of law schools, WVU included, discourage or prohibit you to have a job while you're in law school, especially if you're a 1L in your first year, you are not allowed to work outside of uh, maybe perhaps a work study job at the law school. So, you know, those are all things that, that go into it. And obviously um, I didn't have the ability to pay for it out of pocket. So do I wish that I could do it all over again and skip law school? Absolutely not. Is that antiquated though? I mean, is it, we've seen it with like things like sports, they relax standards where, where people can work now, other areas with things like the gig economy, with technology where people can basically work online and make a good living or have side gigs or be a, you know, you can be an Instagram superstar. I'm so told I'm not on Instagram, but I hear tell there's folks that can do that sort of thing, make money at it. I'm just, I'm just for the example though, is it antiquated to say, no, you can't work a job during law school because with things like the gig economy, there's a lot more flexibility and what is defined as work. Is that something that should be reviewed? You know, it may be, may be antiquated, like you said, maybe it's not that way anymore. Um, I know some students worked anyway. I worked, I did, I had, but I had a, um, a work study job on campus, so maybe it didn't count, but I still worked full time. So, um, or as close as I could get with that job. But yeah, um, again, if you're not cutting it, if your grades are not good enough and you're, because you're working full time, then, and you know, they could, there's other ways they can just, you know, you can go on academic probation, you can lose your, um, you know, lose your spot in the class. So I don't think it's necessary to prohibit from work. And that is a, a good point that maybe that's changing. But uh, the extent to which you can have a job and do be successful in law school will vary person to person. But it's not, it, I, I agree with you that these days, that's probably, it may be less common than it was 20 years ago. Um, not sure. Talking to him, Carpenter, our friend. Okay, you've been open about it. You've wrote about it. You've talked about it. I've talked to you about it because it keeps coming up. Where do you land on student debt? Um, big push now. Uh, there's more talk that President Biden might do some kind of a forgiveness or a forbearance on student loan debt. You have been very open that there was no way you could have gone to college, let alone law school, without student debt. Um, you've talked about it openly. You just talked about having to carry that date. Where do you fall on something like student loan forgiveness? Well, it's, it's a troubling topic for me. Um, on the one hand, yes, I, I, uh, experienced the, the burden of my debt, especially earlier in my career when I wasn't making as much money. Um, but I never, you know, regretted it. I, I still believed that, it, you know, we were raised and I think most kids these days are still raised and I'm guilty of sort of pushing my children that way as well. We are raised to believe that a college education is necessary, that it's a, a goal that you should want to achieve um, if you're going to have success. And, you know, I may be old fashioned. I, I still believe that. Yes, I know there are trades that make a lot of money and that would be fine with me as well. But I still am very uh, encouraging of my children that their plan should be to go to college. And a lot of us grew up with that. And so um, straight out of high school in, the, in May and into college in August, you know, there's not much a, a break in between. And I think if I had taken a break to, you know, get a job instead and, and try to save money, I don't know that I ever would have actually gone back or at least maybe later in life I would have I don't know if I'd taken a year off or two years off at that stage of life if I would have actually ended up going to college so um but you know now I have these these student loan bills I'm still paying every month 
And do I need debt forgiveness? I, me personally, no, I can pay my bills. <laughs> right now I have the money, I have enough income to, to pay the bills, but I'm lucky and I understand that. Um, what I do think is that if there was some forgiveness, uh, means testing, I think is, is important, would be an important part of that. I don't think everybody needs it. Um, I understand the argument that we end up with a lot of uh, middle and upper class people benefiting and the um, people who didn't go to college or didn't get um, you know, degrees where they're making a lot of money that they end up uh, shouldering that burden. So I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that. And um, I, I don't like the argument when I hear it of, I paid my loans, why didn't you, uh, or why shouldn't you? Um, you know, there's a lot of things where things get better in the future than they were for past generations. And I don't like the, it's not fair argument so much. Um, but so, yeah, I think overall a means tested arrangement would be um, something I would support. Um, an interest, you know, we, when somebody's been paying for 20 years and they've paid off more than they borrowed and they still owe more than they've paid off, something is wrong with that system. Uh, my loans are not like that, but, um, you know, those are, those are, I find to be quite insidious. And I think that, you know, those loans are signed for and agreed to by um, 18, 20 year old kids who've been told their entire lives that they have no choice. They've really got to go to college if they want to be a success. And, you know, they think they're doing the right thing. And then now you have, you know, people pointing their fingers at them and telling them they're bums and they just want handouts. And, you know, how dare you complain that you can't afford, you know, a car or a house because you have $200,000 in debt and you've been paying it for 15 years. So there's the things that can be done, I think, on um, short of full out forgiveness that I would support. Uh, M. Carpenter, wonderful conversation. Always enjoy talking to you. Um, you do wonderful work as our senior editor at OrdinaryDashTimes.com. I promise you folks, we could not do it without her. Um, let folks know where they can find your writing and your social media, and they can all follow you, which I should do since I was, I think, one of your first Twitter followers, and I think you were one of my first ones. So tell everybody how they can join our merry band of misfits. Sure. You can find me on Twitter at WV Esquire S. Um, and you, of course, on uh, can find me on Ordinary Times, where um, sometimes I write long form, sometimes I do my writs on Wednesdays. Um, sometimes I'm in the comments sometimes. section. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I, hey, I'm busy. Um, but yeah, please, if you follow me on Twitter, that'd be great. It's ridiculous that Andrew has double the followers that I do. So uh, help me to correct that. Um, I say the world is as it is, but we'll have to leave it there and disagree <laughs> on that. Uh, you are marvelous and wonderful. Thank you so much. Our friend M. Carpenter, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll talk to you again soon, ma'am. Thank you for the time today. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you.